Good evening and welcome to this edition of the God's Word News Service. I am your host, Bishop Gregory, and tonight's report is titled, How Christian Compassion and Compassion in General is Endangering the United States and Her Citizens. Now, assuming that one is born with all of their mental faculties intact, Compassion for the sufferings of others is a normal occurrence. Compassion means to suffer together. It is defined as a deep emotional feeling that wells up inside a person when they are confronted with another person suffering and feel an urge to relieve the suffering. Many of us also feel the same compassion when it comes to the suffering of other species as well. Empathy or altruism are not the same thing as compassion, even though the basic concepts are related. Empathy is a more general ability to take the perspective of and feel the emotions of another person, whereas compassion is when those feelings and thoughts include the desire to help. Altruism, on the other hand, is a kind of selfless behavior, which very often can be accompanied by feelings of compassion. However, one can feel compassion without acting on it. And altruism isn't always motivated by compassion. Scientific research has shown that when we feel compassion, our heart rate slows down, our bodies begin to secrete a bonding hormone called oxytocin, which alleviate, which activates regions of the brain which are connected to empathy, caregiving, and feelings of pleasure, which will lead us to want to approach and care for the suffering individuals or animals. Now, having explained what compassion is, let me explain how compassion can be dangerous. G.K. Chesterton Chesterton wrote the following, The modern world, is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. The virtues have gone mad because they have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone, end of quote. What Chesterton was trying to get across is that when the virtues become unattached from each other, they can do terrible damage. What he has stated is applicable to the current debate about taking in Syrian Muslim refugees and Muslim refugees from several other predominantly Muslim countries, especially when it is well known that Muslim beliefs, traditions, and way of life, along with their wish of not assimilating into the cultures of the countries that are welcoming them, are not compatible with those of Western nations. Starting primarily with the Obama administration, advocates for the refugees are not being criticized for their compassion, but because of their dangerous imprudence, which will lead to very damaging consequences, as has been proven by what is happening in several European countries today. Parallel societies consisting of Muslim immigrants and their children and grandchildren have grown up all over Europe, which in turn has become a launching pad for deadly attacks such as the Paris Massacre, the London tube bombing, which resulted in 756 casualties, and the Madrid train bombings, which left 2,000 200 casualties, which are only the more spectacular incidents. But there are lower levels of violence committed by the Muslim refugees on a daily basis. Not only all across Europe, but right here in the U.S. 
I am talking about beatings, stabbings, and rapes, as well as just plain harassment of non-Muslim citizens and trying to force their Sharia laws on the host societies. In England and Sweden alone, rapes committed by Muslim men and teenage boys have reached epidemic proportions. In one small English city alone, there have been 1,400 such rapes. And what makes the situation so much more egregious is that for whatever reason, the governments of these nations seem loath to take any real meaningful actions to stop these crimes or to punish the perpetrators. Instead, they keep allowing more and more Muslims into their countries, placing their own citizens in grave danger. And the U.S. is no exception. Whether we wish to admit it or not, the eventual reaction on the part of those citizens who want their government to use prudence and common sense in our immigration policies to mass immigration is likely to be just as violent against not only Muslim immigrants, but also against their fellow citizens who support and demand unfettered immigration. The mass importation of Muslim immigrants into Europe was sold to the Europeans by the European Union bureaucrats in the name of compassion and as retribution for the past sins of anti-Semitism. The very few who dared to openly object were denounced and vilified as xenophobes, racists, and Nazis. And we have the same thing going on here. The EU isn't alone in their vilification of those who oppose their asinine immigration policies. The Obama administration, along with the leftists and the mass media, have also cast the debate over Muslim refugees in moral terms. Obama himself has chastised the opposition as shameful and contrary to American values. During a press conference in Manila, Obama shamed those opposed to his immigration policies as being scared of widows and orphans, adding, Quote, we don't make good decisions if they are based on hysteria and an exaggeration of risk. In other words, he seemed far more concerned with his ill-thought-out immigration policies than he does about the safety of his fellow Americans. Hysteria and an exaggeration of risks? What makes this statement by Obama even more ridiculous was the fact that he made them in the Philippines, a place where just about every place of business, every store and shop are protected by heavily armed security guards due to years of Muslim insurgency in that country. The Philippine military have been engaged in a long guerrilla war with the insurgents and even though Muslims on Mindanao, the second largest island in the Philippines, have been granted their own autonomous region, the Philippines continues to be raked by bombings and kidnappings. In 2013 alone, some 60,000 Christians were forced to flee a city in the southern Philippines to escape an attack by Muslim terrorists. As a prime example of what can happen when the Muslim population passes a critical point, the Philippines was hardly the place to laugh about exaggerated risks. Whenever the Muslim population passes the critical point in any town or city that they settle in, the non-Muslim citizens are eventually forced out through threats, assaults, and even murder by the Muslims, who then set up their Sharia law courts and even Sharia police departments. The regular 
Official police refuse to enter those areas, which then become known as no-go zones. And the Muslim immigrants are pretty much allowed to do as they please. Thus, the question is, how do we balance Christian compassion with the safety of our own nation, ourselves, and our children? This question becomes even more important in the light of the statement from the founder of the highly influential Council on American-Islamic Relations, known as CARE, Omar Ahmad, who said, quote, that Islam must one day dominate the U.S., end of quote. The Council on American-Islamic Relations is an extremist organization founded by members of the Muslim Brotherhood, which just so happens to be the founding organization of many Muslim terrorist groups, such as Hamas, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, etc. Under the Obama administration, many members of the Muslim Brotherhood were appointed to very high and influential positions in the Department of Homeland Security, the State Department, the White House, the FBI, and even the military by Obama himself. We certainly cannot ignore the fact that the Islamic State, ISIS, has made no secret of its intention to infiltrate refugee groups. And what makes that statement even more terrifying is the admission by several U.S. intelligence experts and officials that we have no effective vetting system in place. Even the former head of the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration, Jay Johnson, said that, quote, we're not going to know a whole lot, end of quote, about the Syrian or other Muslim refugees. Yet Obama had insisted on authorizing the admission of thousands of Muslims while all but completely ignoring the plight of Christian refugees from the Middle East who are facing genocide at the hands of, the, of Muslims all over the Middle East. And bear in mind, it only takes one to three jihadists to inflict massive casualties on a community. Two men with AK-47s can kill hundreds in a matter of seconds. The bomb that killed 224 passengers on a Russian airliner was, in all probability, placed on board by a single individual. The majority of the Muslim refugees may have no intentions of doing such things, but it is a huge error to project our Western and Christian values and traditions onto them. There is a reason why Muslims either find it difficult or have no desire to assimilate into Western cultures. That reason is because Islam, as a culture, is in many ways antithetical to the Western cultures. In the European camp, refugee camps, the Christian refugees have had to be taken to separate facilities because they have, been fa they have faced repeated attacks on them by Muslim refugees. As individuals, most Muslim refugees may be good and, pe and uh, peaceful people, but it is a fact that they are the bearers of their culture, a culture which inclines toward intolerance, violence, and supremacy. Their own holy book, the Koran, is filled with teachings calling for all true Muslims to enslave or kill those who refuse to submit to Islam. And it, is, it also calls for them to lie to non-Muslims if it will further the spread of Islam. Compassion 
must be tempered with common sense. Yes, the plight of the refugees is heartbreaking, but then so is the death of our own American men, women, and children from terrorist attacks at the hands of Muslims we have compassionately taken in. Remember the children killed and maimed in the Boston Marathon bombing? It is also well known that a large number of the Muslim refugees are young and often single men in excellent physical shape. Under these circumstances, it is undeniable that it would be criminally irresponsible for our federal government to ignore its duty to show compassion to its own citizens in order to extend compassion to the Muslim refugees. Being compassionate includes being compassionate to all concerned, both those who are here in the U.S., as well as those who want to come. Of course, both Christian and non-Christian American citizens may feel obligated and are free to disregard their own safety in order to minister to others in distress. But they have no right to make the, that decision to endanger the rest of us. G.K. Chesterton stated that when the virtues get out of hand, they can be destructive, which is certainly the case in Europe, where the compassionate response to Muslim migrants and refugees has resulted in far more harm than good. And this will be the same result here in the United States. If we do not demand that our government use common sense, since we know the risks involved and have heard the warnings by intelligence officials concerning the flaws in the vetting process, would it not be prudent to call a halt or at least a pause to the Muslim refugee resettlement, which is exactly what President Trump and his administration want to do? Rather than fighting against his proposed temporary immigration ban, we should be urging its passage. It has been reported that the FBI has revealed that it is pursuing 900 investigations against Islamic State-inspired operatives in all 50 states in the U.S., and that there are jihadist training camps located in several states across the U.S. Even so, Roman Catholic bishops, in response to those against mass immigration of Muslims, have been in the habit of warning against irrational fears. However, in the light of the extensive FBI investigations, it seems that some of these fears may be very rational, since in Europe, Fears that at one time were labeled irrational have turned out to be well-founded. And those who really do not know or understand the Constitution, it is not against the Constitution to ban Muslims from immigrating to the U.S. And contrary to what we hear on the various news stations, including Fox, there is nothing in the Constitution that says we cannot have a religious test for choosing who we allow to immigrate or enter the U.S. The only place in the Constitution that mentions a ban on having a religious test is in Article 6, Paragraph 3, which reads, the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution, but no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. 
Allow me to read that again. Quote, the senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. End of quote. As you can see, there is absolutely nothing in that article that mentions immigration. It pertains only to those seeking public office. Another argument that the left and some on the right use is the First Amendment, often called the Establishment Clause, which states, quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This amendment pertains only to barring the federal government from establishing a state religion or church, or from preventing the citizens from exercising their right to practice their religion. This article is for the United States government and for the citizens of the United States only. It does not extend to citizens of other countries and has nothing whatsoever to do with immigration. But there is another solution to the dilemma of being compassionate and protecting our own homeland, our traditions, and our people. It is not an either-or situation, because as a civilized nation, we can practice compassion by providing refugees a safe zone right in their own homeland under the protection of American air and military power. And if the churches feel so inclined, they can, along with the United Nations, accept contributions to feed, clothe, and house not only the Muslim refugees, but the Christian refugees as well. This is compassion in its truest sense. Christian compassion and Christian charity does not require, nor does it demand, putting one's own country and fellow citizens in danger. Well, thank you for joining me this evening, and may the good Lord bless each of you and keep you safe. And please watch for my follow-up video on how the United States is under threat of judicial tyranny, which places us in extreme danger from Muslim attacks from within. Thank <laughs> you.